and now went to their NIH and from NIH is now in the uh, capital of United States, Washington DC at the George Washington University and has done a lot of elegant work in diabetes, heart disease, but his current area of interest is also in vascular cells and gene therapy where he got his doctoral degree and uh, Sabha Sachi Chen thanks a ton for uh, allowing us to give us the US perspective of COVID and diabetes. Uh, Professor Sen has a and I must thank my good friend Parthakar for allowing him to speak out of turn and I hope your slides are uploaded here and we can hear your pearls of wisdom. Sabha Sachi. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me and uh, I hope you can see my screen as well. Uh, yeah, we, we are good. Okay. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to give this talk uh, to uh, Professor Joshi and uh, Professor Sabu. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I'm actually now the professor of the division and also the associate professor, associate chief of the division at George Washington. So I'm going to give you a US perspective. I'm not going to talk about what is almost already known, but being a command center for the White House, I thought I should give you what is at the forefront of COVID-19 as we speak on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, this is a, just a beginning slide in saying that there is multiple countries affected with uh, multiple cases throughout the world. This is a, a map from very recently from June 12, uh, 2020. And in the United States right now, we have a, a huge number of cases with 23,000 new cases uh, yesterday with the total number of deaths, which as you can see quite high we have one of the highest mortalities in the world. Uh, and I have shown you the number of cases that we have and the, at the bottom of it, I have shown you the age groups. And I think they, it's a, at least in the United States, there is a concept that it doesn't affect the young people. And as you can see from the numbers, it clearly does. Uh, though it's quite, high also in the elderly population and the mortality may be high, but the number of cases is still high throughout all the age groups. And as you know, even if one gets over the disease, there is residual effect of the disease for respiratory issues, renal issues, and maybe even beta cell death. So uh, prevention, uh, we, know from the command center that the it's clearly a airborne droplet disease as well as a fomite disease uh, and it seems that airborne droplet is becoming the main modality of SARS-CoV transmission and that a, almost throughout the United States we have a mandated use of face mask. Uh, this was also associated with significant transmission reduction in China, Italy and more importantly in New York and Philadelphia. Uh, unfortunately, our cases are going up now again because of our first phase of lifting of lockdown. And there's a clear correlation when the lockdown was lifted versus when it was in place as far as the transmission. So uh, person to person transmission is clearly a cause. So although, uh, so I'm going to talk about very recent updates on the medications that we use, not just as an endocrinologist, but also as an internist. And I think it's good to know because all of us at some point in time do manage internal medicine patients as well. Uh, and although there were previous investigation of several antiviral agents, the COVID-19 has failed to show a clinical benefit uh, as far as uh, our studies go and a new study suggested that it may be even associated with a faster viral clearance in non-severe patients with higher lymphocyte count that's important but it's unsure to say whether it's association or causation these are lopinavir and ritonavir as you know these are standard antiviral agents and has been used in HIV and in the systemic review of 18 articles that I went through 
uh, and these were five of them were actually randomized controlled trials. There was wide heterogeneity of data for these antiviral agents. And at this moment in time, we don't advocate using any of these on a routine basis. The newer version of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which regulates the macrophage activation, showed improvement in its measures of inflammation. And as you know, as you have already heard, that inflammation and cytokine storm are uh, critical in COVID, uh, which probably leads to worsening of insulin resistance, thrombosis formation, uh, and we have seen thrombosis patients, not just in elderly, but as young as 12 years old and even eight years old. Uh, and uh, however, this tyrosine kinase inhibitor has been shown to have some improvement in reduction of inflammation. Uh, other treatments, as uh, Dr. Raz already mentioned, ongoing treatment with RAS inhibitors was not associated with increased mortality in patients uh, and maybe even beneficial in certain studies from Italy and China. So we are not advocating a stopping of either ACE or ARB in the United States uh, at the moment. So there are also some studies on mesenchymal stromal cells being used for COVID-19, particularly in patients who had undergone ARBs uh, and However, that did not show a statistical significance, but there is a trend of improvement and it may be a last resort in patients who are not responding to any standard therapy. As you know, mesenchymal stromal cells has been shown to be immune modulatory. So that may be one of the mechanisms how it may be working. So the NIH uh, and CDC has updated its COVID-19 treatment guidelines um, and it has uh, very unanimously decided that use of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine and we have even seen in our patients in our hospital that it actually did more damage than good as far as renal outcomes are concerned and it has revoked its emergency use authorization. Uh, the only drug that seems to be working right now in most of our patients, whether diabetic or non-diabetic, is remdesivir. So this is advocated for almost all hospitalized patients with severe COVID. And it has been advocated and we have started using it in any patients whose saturation has dropped to less than 94%. Uh, and uh, we also have seen some improvement with ECMO. Unfortunately, as you know, there's a worldwide shortage of these machines, though in the last month, we have seen several machines come in to our hospitals and around the United States. Uh, now, the question is, do we recommend this uh, antiviral therapy for patients who are not intubated? Uh, and the panel recommended that the hospitalized patient with severe COVID who are not intubated can receive up to five days of remdesivir. This is a A1 recommendation. Uh, and those patients who have not responded to five days and who are already on ECMO, you might extend it to up to 10 days. Uh, however, for patients who have only mild symptoms, uh, there is no clear data whether remdesivir actually works. The other two agents that we are currently investigating are IL-1 inhibitor and IL-6 inhibitor. And uh, though the, there is no change in official recommendation right now, but IL-6 inhibitors actually do show some trend in improvement, particularly um, docizumab. Um, and the lastly, I want to, I know uh, we have a colleague here from the United Kingdom and uh, I'm hopefully not stealing any limelight, but that semethazone has recently been um, looked into as a possible therapy uh, from a recovery trial, which is a randomized clinical trial in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it showed that there was a lowering of death rate. However, as you know, there was a concern from NIH and CDC initially not to use any steroids in these patients because of fear of uh, viremia or worsening of viremia. However, uh, 
when this study came out, there was a lot of hope. However, uh, it seems to be a couple of things that this medication seems to be only be helpful for patients who were on a ventilator or needed extra oxygen and there was no benefit for less than less severe symptoms. So it's almost at the last stage, which might help to reduce down the, the storm. Uh, however, full results of this study are expected soon and until then, we are not using it in any of our patients right now. Uh, or that's what is the current recommendation. Uh, I also wanted to mention about the lipid management, though I don't have a, a study here, but we are actually doing a study that we have submitted. We have seen categorically that the patients who come in, in spite of having high triglyceride and low HDL, seems to have uh, low LDL at, at, uh, in initial admission, and they seem to do worse in the long term. So that's something to be looked into. And in those patients, presence of statin beforehand, I'm talking about uh, pre-diabetic or diabetic patients, did not help in reducing the mortality in that population. So, uh, and lastly, I wanted to talk about testing. There's a lot of confusion about testing of these patients. So the NIH CDC panel recommended that a molecular or antigen testing for SARS-CoV should be used to diagnose the acute infection, which means that the current serological assays have some limitations in their performance and their ability to determine whether the patient is immune to SARS-CoV. In light of these limitations, the panel from NIH and CDC recommended against use of serological testing as a sole basis for the diagnosis of acute SARS-CoV. It also recommended against uh, use of serological testing to determine whether a person is immune to this disease because the so-called immunity concept of SARS-CoV has not been established as of yet. So the standard of testing should still remain a molecular or antigen testing rather than serological. And that's all I had. So thank you, thank Dr. You. Sen, for, for a wonderful presentation. I'll just like to share something. I'm on the task force for our Maharashtra state in Mumbai. And you know, Mumbai has more cases than China put together. And uh, you know, we have uh, followed some similar protocols. We had started with a mortality rate of almost 10 to 12%. Now we are down to 3%. And we have access to emergency use of remdesivir. We also have favipiravir, which we are using in the early stages and uh, we have two IL-6 blockers which we are putting in research mode. One is a etolizumab which is a CD26 molecule and that is a proper control study which will be out soon which is also off-label available for plaque psoriasis and we have IL-6 blocker of tocilizumab available with us and we have found that diabetes is our number one comorbidity in which deaths occur and we often find a lot of COVID hyperglycemia, we use insulin in many of them. So I, I am very happy that you are sharing the US experience and uh, we have also gone in a research mode beyond uh, people who have prolonged QT intervals with hydroxychloroquine and uh, uh, azithromycin. Uh, we have used ivermectin and doxycycline in a research mode and also for the steroid part of it, we use the Henry Ford Michigan protocol where if somebody's uh, six minute walk test uh, desaturates to less than 3% or below 92%, then we give them IV methylprednisolone 40 mg BID for 3 to 5 days. And we have been aggressively using many of these approaches. Mumbai is now having a doubling time above 13 many spots, and uh, but we still are a very large cluster dense geography, so we are trying our best to help it. So it was a very wonderful presentation which you are doing. You made a comment on the serological tests. So do you have the uh, quantitative uh, tests for IgM and IgG separately because these combined tests seem to be of no use. So do you yeah. have that? And we are yeah. using a lot of covalent plasma in Maharashtra where we actually are measuring the uh, IgG uh, neutralizing antibodies for a critical yeah. titer. So, so do you have all those facilities up there in, in Washington? Yes. So we do have uh, both uh, the two serological tests that you mentioned against IgG and IgM. Uh, but as I said, 
this, we still are mostly basing our diagnosis on qPCR of the viral genome uh, and uh, direct antigen testing. Most of our, in fact, uh, there has been some cases with non-qPCR testing where the patient was deemed negative and all of us went in to see the patient, luckily not me, but my intern, and then the patient turned positive. And however, I have not seen that situation in where we have actually done a qPCR, which has standardized using the right probes for a, for a viral genome, for the prime portion of the viral genome. So as you know, there's this concept of testing. I think for this pandemic, the testing is kind of paramount, whether it's diabetes patients or non-diabetes patients. And I, I was trying to search yesterday is there a difference between diabetic and non-diabetic patients as far as testing results are concerned? I think because of the inherent inflammatory condition that's there in diabetes, sometimes that could be tricky. What's your experience on that? So, no, we have a false uh, negative rate of swabs to around 30 percent and we rely more on HRCT. So, many a times of swab it can be negative but HRCT picks up a much a ground glassing much earlier. So I completely agree with you there. And diabetics tend to mask the disease, but you need to take the uh, nasal swab and the throat swab in the right way. And it should be painful enough like a brain biopsy, as they say. So if right. it's not appropriately taken, then often you tend to miss it. And I think we have to treat every patient as potential COVID and take full PPE. You know, we have field hospitals. Probably Mumbai is the only place in the world apart from Wuhan, which has built five field hospitals of 1,000 beds each because of the large uh, number of the city because we have a very uh, we have almost uh, 6 million population in urban slums and that's really the focal point so we have a big big challenge which we are facing so wonderful right. one last question yeah. you do a lot of work on on stem cells so what's right. your take on measles camel stem cells in covid right so uh, i had a one stem there that there is actually five rcts going on that's looking at stem cell therapy in patients who are already diagnosed to have ARDS in these patients. And in those patients, depend, so you know, it depends on, we haven't actually figured out, it's like a therapy. We haven't figured out how many, how much stem cells to give. So in a right dose, it actually might help to at least reduce down the inflammatory condition. So I think it has potential, but uh, I would be cautious in saying that, oh, it has worked. I personally know of some studies that are ongoing right now, uh, and I think, I mean, because this disease is here to stay for a while, unfortunately, so, and we have to look at some of these modalities where hopefully young patients, we can improve their, uh, such as respiratory um, capacity and so on. Thanks. Thanks, Professor. Wonderful. You. you gave us the best and sorry we had to move a juggle bit. So thanks a ton. And now we have the superstar batsman amongst us who is really a true superstar. I call him a Twitter star, uh, Facebook star and he's omnipresent everywhere. Partha Kar, we love you. He's a senior consultant in diabetes and endocrinology at the Portsmouth NHS Trust Hospital. He's a clinical director of diabetes. He's an award winner at all levels.